Hey students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And in today's video, we're gonna review all the topics which will be coming up on your exam two. This includes uh, content out of chapter five, which has to do with two-dimensional and three-dimensional equilibrium of rigid bodies. Out of chapter six, which has to do with structures, both trusses and frames and machines. Chapter seven, which is centroids. And chapter eight, which is shear and moment, both at a single point and also shear and moment diagrams. Okay, so that's the content which will be on your exam two. So free body diagrams, while they were on exam one, of course, we're gonna to need to draw them for every single equilibrium problem in statics. And so they'll be included here on exam two as well. The steps to draw a free body diagram are to isolate the body. That means draw it separate from your problem sketch, okay, isolate it all by itself, and then essentially add your axis system, add all of your applied forces, and then everything that you cut away in your isolation step, all of the different supports, you wanna replace those with forces and couple moments that are coming from those supports. And then the, the dimensions are optional. This should say not instead of now. Um, but if, if you want to, you can add the dimensions on there. It just depends if you already have enough information or enough kind of clutter. Often I don't put dimensions on there, but that's up to you. All right, so solving an equilibrium problem, we're gonna draw that free body diagram. We then are going to essentially write our equations of equilibrium from the free body diagram, right? The free body diagram is the pictorial representation. It's our model of all of the different forces acting on a body and also the applied and body forces. And then we are also going to um, make sure that in these equations, they're set equal to zero right, because some force equal to zero, some moments equal to zero. Now, commonly for two-dimensional problems, this is gonna be a sum force X, sum force Y, and a sum of moment, but we could actually sum moments about three different points long, as long as the points were on the same line. There's other options, okay? So uh, feel free to look in our textbook under the solving strategies um, section in chapter six, and you can look through and kind of think through some of those solving strategies. Three-dimensional equilibrium really has the same flow as two-dimensional equilibrium, except for it's just a little bit more complex, right? So our drawings are going to be three-dimensional drawings. Now we pick up a third uh, direction for forces. We can also have forces in the Z. Now we can also have moments in the Y and the Z as well. And so we now have up to a total of six equations. Um, and once again, it's up to, you don't have to use six. There are some problems that don't need all six, but can have up to six equations with six unknowns. Now, noting for the exam, I wouldn't set up a three-dimensional problem that required you or, or really needed um, a linear algebra solution through matrices. Uh, if I give you a three-dimensional problem to solve, it's going to be something with easy enough equations that you can work through it with substitution to find those answers. All right, the next topic we covered was stability and determinacy. And we covered this essentially to say that there's certain problems that are solvable in statics. There's certain problems that are not solvable in statics. And this is the criteria we use to determine which problems are solvable or not. And keep in mind, this is, exter this is independent of external forces, okay? So um, when we draw up basically these little diagrams and you analyze whether things are stable and determinate, they will not include any body forces, they will not include any external forces or external couples, okay? only the reactions. So this is a reaction specific analysis. Uh, the other thing here is we wanna make sure that we recognize that we're gonna just, just gonna assume that any roller or any two force support can provide support in either direction. Okay, so if you have a uh, roller on a horizontal surface, let's say we have two rollers on a horizontal surface and this box here and then maybe another roller over here. We're going to assume that the horizontal roller can support forces either to the left or right, and these vertical rollers can support forces either up or down. Okay, so um, just simplifies things a little bit and in, instead of working about, worrying about this one dimensional motion, just assume that any um, of those can support forces in either direction. All right, so three steps. One two, and three. These are in the order basically of ease. You could technically do these in any order you wanted. But the first one looks at if there are three 
support forces, okay? Either support forces or technically also support couples. If there are three, we know we have three equations for a two-dimensional equilibrium problem. Therefore, we have a determinant setup where equations are equal to unknowns. All right, so now technically if you have less than three, it is determinate but not stable. If you have more than three, it is statically indeterminate. We can have extra supports in a physical system. And it turns out as we get into deformation, which you'll cover in later classes, you'll add in extra equations that you could solve for more and more unknowns. But right now in statics, dealing with rigid bodies, we have three equations on a two-dimensional problem. All right, the next thing we look at is the stability. So number two is stability for translation. And really what we're looking for here is we do not want parallel supports. Parallel supports mean that it would not prevent uh, motion perpendicular to that parallel support. Okay, so if you had a horizontal surface and three rollers, of course, it's not going to stop any kind of horizontal translation. And then for preventing rotation, we want to make sure that the lines of action intersect at two or more points. Often it's only two, but it, there's actually there's a possibility of having up to three intersection points. Uh, so two or more points means stability for rotation. One single point, okay, one intersection point of all three lines of action is a bad thing, and it means that it, the body is not stable about that point. All right, so that wraps up chapter five. Getting into chapter six. Chapter six is also an equilibrium chapter, so all of the analysis we're doing is still going to be summing forces, summing moments equal to zero. Uh, but now we're instead of dealing with the single body, we're dealing with multiple bodies. And for the first two thirds of chapter six, we're dealing with trusses. And trusses are 100% two force bodies, okay? Being a two force body, we've talked about those quite a bit here in statics, means they can only be in tension or compression and nothing else. So in order to be a two force body, we need to have a couple of things happen. One is we need to make sure all loading is coming through the joints, because of course, if we add any of those forces along a member, it becomes a multi-force body and eh, fails the assumption of two force bodies. And then the other thing is that if we cut across any of these members, we reveal their internal forces. Okay, and this is going to be true the whole rest of the class, is if you cut across a rigid body, you expose what's going on inside. Now, because these are two force bodies, the only thing going on inside is that there's tension or compression forces. If you cut across a multi-force body, as we'll get into in chapter 7, yeah, I'm just double checking my brain, that's right, chapter, uh, we're looking at internal loads, then we're going to have axial shear and moment. Okay, but here in chapter six, we only have axial. Now solving for these, it's really up to you, but I think it's often easiest to go ahead and assume that every single member is in tension. And in your algebraic solving, if you get a negative value, you know that's gonna prove that things are in compression. All right, so building upon stability and determinacy of a rigid body, Right, a truss is still a rigid body. Keep in mind that an overall truss is in equilibrium, each member is in equilibrium, each joint is in equilibrium, uh, each section is in equilibrium. Okay, we can slice it up a whole bunch of different ways, but everything's in equilibrium. So we're going to satisfy the same three equations we did for um, a rigid body n equals three, not parallel supports, and not one point of intersection. And we're adding one more. Okay, we're adding an internal determinacy. And fundamentally, this is actually proving whether or not a truss is, quote, simple. Okay, so a simple truss is made of triangles. There's no redundancy. And this equation, m plus 3, the number of members plus 3 support forces, is equal to 2 times j. This is fundamentally an unknowns is equal to equations um, validation then we have a simple truss. Now keep in mind that zero force members, uh, which we're gonna talk about in the next section, you see it right below here, don't apply for stability and determinacy because zero force members require that we've actually put the applied loads onto a truss, but stability and determinacy is not including any applied loads, okay? So just like in chapter five for rigid bodies, only the reactions coming from the supports for stability and determinacy analysis.
All right, zero force members. So for zero force members, we have two different rules. One of those rules or cases is where two members meet at an unloaded joint. Both of them are going to be zero force. And that should make sense if you went and summed your force in the X, some force in the Y. You have two unknowns, your two member forces, and no applied forces. And fundamentally, you're going to need everything is equal to zero. Case two looks at where we have three forces. Now these forces can come from reactions, they can come from members, they can come from external forces. So basically when you draw a free body diagram, if you have three forces coming into that joint, and this would be a method of joints problem, and two of those forces are in one straight line, then the third one's gonna be a zero force member. Okay, and you can prove that to yourself by summing forces perpendicular to those two collinear members. And the third one will be a zero force. Of course, what this would look like if we had our joint and we had a force coming up this direction, another member force coming this direction, and then a third here, call this um, F1, F2, and f three, really what's going to happen here is that F1 as a vector is going to be equal to F2 as a vector. And if those are equal to each other, there's nothing left for F3. So then F3 is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so that is our zero force case or rule number two. Now, either one of these rules only needs to apply to one end of the beam. Okay, not both. One end of the beam, member, whatever you like to call it, of a truss. Also, once you get rid of some zero force members, go look for more. Okay, this is an iterative process. Iterative meaning that we need to do it over and over until all of the zero force members are gone. We're left with triangles, which basically is the simplest truss to carry the given loads. Now, one side note on zero force members. Practically, there are never zero force members. And one of the big reasons for that is that every single truss you ever find will be made of members and those members will have their own weight, right? They'll have a self weight and they'll also probably su they'll support some kind of a bridge decking or something else that has its own weight. Okay, so you're gonna distribute a weight onto every single joint onto a truss, uh, at least, you know, whether it's from the self weight of the members or the self weight of the decking. And so zero force members are a practical tool we use here in statics, but in the real world, when, like I said, not only do we have all these different forces, there's also deformation once you include deformation, um, some of these, most of these zero force members wouldn't apply, wouldn't, it wouldn't be validated for zero force if the overall truss was deforming. Okay, so that's just a side note, but here for statics, we can use these cases and get rid of them um, with either case. All right, two different ways that we can solve for um, truss members. Um, fundamentally, method of joints works fine as long as you're looking to solve for something either close to like the ends or a good starting point. And we know that a starting point has less than two unknowns and one or more known. Or if you need to solve for everything, okay? And you can you basically solve for everything, setting up a free body diagram of every single joint, going through solving for the values and also tension or compression of each one. Method of sections is the strategic technique which can zoom in on just single joints, um, excuse me, just single members or multiple members that are close together by doing section cuts. Okay, so instead of cutting around each joint, you cut all the way through the truss, cutting it into separate pieces, and every single member you cut exposes its internal force. Okay, if you don't cut it, it doesn't bleed. Uh, is one way I like to think about that. So all the other members that aren't cut, you don't expose their forces. The ones that are cut, you do expose their forces. Okay, draw your free body diagram and basically then set up either your sum of forces or here we found that some of moments were really strategic um, in order to isolate only limited number of unknowns in certain equations. And another nice thing, nice thing about method of sections is you only need to solve for your supports as needed. So whatever supports would show up on your method of sections cut that portion of your truss. Solve for those, but the others you don't have to solve for if you don't want to. Now these tools can be used in sequence. You could do a method of joints and then do a method of sections. You could do a method of sections, then do a method of joints. They are separate but related tools that you could use in the same problem. 
Okay, so it's not like all problems or 100% method of joints or 100% method of sections. And I will leave it up to you to decide um, how to solve the assigned problems on the exam. All right, frames and machines was a bit of a shift. The reason it was a shift is that we no longer had all two-force members or two-force bodies, but we had at least one multi-force member or body, which basically pushed us, instead of doing section cuts, instead of doing a method of joints, we went back to doing free body diagrams of bodies, okay? Um, and so, Frames and Machines is, is essentially an extension of Chapter 5, doing single body free body diagrams. We're now doing multiple body free body diagrams, but they're of the bodies, okay? So no joints, no sections for multi-force bodies. But we can do joints and sections for two-force bodies, okay, for truss systems. And the number of equations comes from the type of body that it is. Multi-force bodies have three. Concurrent force bodies, which are basically, you can treat them as particles, have two, just like out of chapter three. And a two-force body has one. All it says is that the force on the one end is equal to the force on the other end. Uh, one of the big things in frames and machines, and once you pick this up, it's, it seems like old, old hat, is that all internal forces are equal and opposite. Okay, equal and opposite. So when we separate a body, we want to make sure that the forces from one body are equal and opposite to the forces on the other body. Okay, and that's basically on, the, on your separate free body diagrams. In rigid systems, essentially anything we can remove from the supports and it's made of fundamentally triangles, right? Just like a truss was rigid, made of triangles. We can go ahead and solve for those reactions. What you're going to notice in a rigid system, you typically have n is equal to three supports, where a non-rigid system, basically you have n is greater than four supports. Okay, that's another clue. Of, like, if you're wondering, is this rigid or non-rigid? You can look at the number of supports and that will help clue you into if it's rigid or non-rigid. Do not, and I said this at the start of the section, I'll say at the end, do not use method of joints or method of sections on frame and machine problems. Okay, if you have multi-force bodies, you're actually exposing the internal forces. And I, I said that was internal forces or internal loads were in seven. I take it back, they're in eight. Um, sorry for that error earlier in this video. But we'll talk about how to deal with those in chapter eight. But at this point in chapter six, um, you're not set up to deal with those. So just make sure you break up things into separate bodies, separate free body diagrams, add all your forces, write your equations, solve for your unknowns. All right, we took a quick dip into chapter seven, focusing simply on the composite parts. Now there's a whole bunch of integration you can do to find um, centroids, and you're gonna do a fair amount of that in calculus three, or maybe you already did in calculus three. So we're gonna focus in statics on the composite part focus, which is really using a table of relationships, relationships for areas, relationships for this X bar EL, which is a horizontal distance from your Y axis over to the centroid of a part, or or Y bar EL, which is a vertical distance from the um, axis system to the centroid of a part. And you're gonna add up all of these first moments of area. Okay, you have a first moment of area for each axis and divide them by the total area. Noting that the total area um, for all three, X bar, Y bar, Z bar, is just the total area. So you can use the same value for each one of those. And we do have parallel equations for mass, for volume, or for weight. And if you're computing things relative to mass, volume, or weight, you basically substitute in an M, V, or W for the A, okay? Both in the top and in the bottom. So same equations, just using first moment of mass, first moment of, of volume, or first moment of weight, instead of the first moment of area. Um, make sure that you know that X bar EL and Y bar EL can be negative, and that's if they're going in a negative direction uh, according to your axis system. And any kind of a hole or a cutout in your shape is gonna end up with a negative area, mass, volume, or weight. Okay, and if you set up these things in your table, negatives for your holes, negative distances or positive distances, then all you have to do is multiply numbers as you get over to the right side and sum those columns and you'll be on your way. All right, so one of the applications of centroids we have here in statics is for distributed loads. Okay, a triangular distributed load looks like this. And so it has some maximum value up here. And this is always in a force per length. And so say we had five pounds per foot. Okay, that's the maximum value distributed load here. Down at this point, it's actually zero pounds 
per foot. And if this happens to be over a length of six feet, we could find the area of this triangle. One half base times height is going to be five times six divided by two. And so that's going to be equal to 15 pounds, right? Because pound foot times foot is going to be pounds. And we're going to pass that through the centroid of this body. Okay, and, and I shouldn't say the body, the centroid of this load, which is right about here. It's going to be located here at base over three from the right triangle corner. Okay, this is the right triangle corner here. Fundamentally, it's going to be a distance over three from any face. Um, so it's not only base over three from here, it's also going to be um, one third of its height, and it's going to be one third of the distance from this face all the way down to the far corner. Okay, that's where the centroid is for a triangle. But we can pass a 15-pound force through that centroid, and it is externally equivalent. Okay, externally, because if you had a concentrated force versus the distributed force, it has different implications for the inside of the beam, but not for the outside of the beam. Okay, and so we'll talk about the inside of the beam coming up next in Chapter 8. Once you create your free body diagram with this externally equivalent point load, you can solve it just like usual. usual. Okay, so we're basically using centroids to turn things back into point loads so that we can solve them using the same skills we've learned previously. Chapter 8, which is looking at what's going on inside of a beam. We are including three of the four total internal um, loads. We can talk about them at this point. A tension or compression in axial, shear, which cuts, which cuts across a beam, and bending moment, which bends a beam into smiling or frowning. Okay. We also had positive sign conventions, and basically what these do for us is if we cut a beam... We'll do a real short beam here with these cuts. Um, so if we cut a horizontal beam, tension, we're always going to assume positive for axial. Uh, let me label these. So this would be our axial force. Um, shear, which is going to attempt to rotate the body in the negative right-hand rule direction. right? So this would be my positive shear. Just like going up on this face, this face would be my positive shear. And then bending moment will cause the beam to smile. And so wrapping up this direction, this would be my positive M. And my positive M on this one, wrapping up around the end also, positive M. Okay, those are the three positive... Um, axial shear and moment at a cut for a horizontal beam. Uh, and you can take a look in your notes that they're, you can repeat those same applications for a vertical beam. So if you have internal loads at a point, we can use either one of these free body diagrams, either the left or the right, plus the external and the reactions, external forces or couples and reactions, to basically solve for these three, one, two, three unknowns. Okay, So everything else would have to be known, and you can solve for those three unknowns using your standard sum force x, sum force y, sum moment equations. Now, if you get negative values, it just tells you that you ended up with a negative um, axial force, which is compression, a negative shear which is just it's just a sign convention defined as negative shear and a negative moment which is again another sign convention defining negative moment and those positive and negative shears will line up with your positive and negative shears from your shear and moment diagrams which you also learned about here in chapter eight all right shear and moment diagrams um, the cool thing about them we can solve for every single point of our shear and moment along the entire length of a beam and there's actually three different options to create them the first is the section technique and it really looks a lot like the technique you used in the previous where you find internal loads at a point except you put in a distance as an unknown variable Okay, an unknown x value, and then you basically solve for your v and your m as a function of that x. The cool thing about it, it requires absolutely no calculus. The pain about it is that deriving these equations can be quite a bit of work, and you have to write um, each you have to write a equation both for shear and moment for every single loading segment. Um, and loading segments, if we take a look at those, so if we take a look at two different beams. And let's say this one has a support force here, a support force here. Um, let's make this one cantilever. So put a support force here and a support couple. Okay, so cantilever is basically when it hangs off of a wall. And if the top one here, let's put a concentrated force right there. That works fine. And on this one, let's put a distributed load from here to here. And let's put a couple right here. Okay, so a torsional couple and a distributed load. 
when we're talking about a loading segment, what we're talking about is dividing this beam into segments over which nothing happens between the segments. Okay, so for this one here, I'll use Roman numerals for my loading segments. So this is one, this is two, this is three, and this one down here from this end to the distributed load, nothing changes. From there to the couple, nothing changes. From there to the wall, nothing changes. So actually both of these ended up with one, two, and three loading segments. Okay, so that is loading segments. You don't have to think about loading segments quite as much using the graphical technique as you do with either the section cut technique or the calculus technique, but I just wanted to reinforce that's what we're talking about with loading segments is spaces of the beam that basically have a consistent loading or, or kind of between point loadings. All right. So, um, and again, you're going to cut along here, and like I said, you're going to define a distance, say, from here to here as an unknown value x. You're still going to draw your internal shear, bending, um, and axial forces. Now, noting that most of these shear moment problems don't include horizontal forces, which would give us an axial force. Um, and if you draw them, with again, with the assumed positive shear, assumed positive moment, then the equations you derive as a function of x will be the exact same equations that you'll get, the exact same shapes you'd get from either of the other two techniques. All right, the graphical technique is focused on the application that slopes are derivatives and integrals are areas. Okay, so this uh, reaches back to Calc 1. And in Calc 1, um, essentially these are the Calc 1 sections. I wanted to highlight there. These are the Calc... Mm -hmm. Try one more time. Third time is a charm. There it is. Those are the Calc 1 sections over here that um, dealing with the slopes and areas. And the jumps are fundamentally related to concentrated forces or concentrated couples. And so we can have vertical jumps in the shear from vertical forces, okay? Upward force, upward jump, downward force, downward jump. Looking at couples, a little bit more complicated. Um, I did add, this is kind of like all three ways you could represent a couple, either with the actual drawn arrow here, or counterclockwise and clockwise, or positive right-hand rule and negative right-hand rule. Okay, so however you define that couple, all the ones in the top there define a downward moment jump, and all in the bottom define an upward moment jump. Um, I have actually been going with, as much as anything else lately, drawing on the left-hand side, which, of course, for this bottom one would look like this, right? If we wrap it around, um, that's negative from the right-hand rule, but the arrowhead is going up. It means our moment, our, that couple causes our moment diagram to jump up as well. The only other piece that isn't listed here that's, I think, probably worth noting is that all... V and M diagrams start and end at zero. Okay, that's a really good clue that you need all of your shear diagrams to close, start at zero, close to zero, all your moment diagrams to start at zero, close zero. Of course, if you have a concentrated force at the very end, either end of a beam, you are going to have a vertical step, but either at the start of the beam, either before the vertical force will be at zero, at the end of the beam, after the vertical force will be at zero. Okay, so they still will close to zero. The calculus technique is relying on the fact that you can write equations for your loads. This works well as we have more complex loads and you essentially you can write an equation for that load and then you'll integrate to get your shear, integrate to get your moment. You need to bring in your concentrated forces and couples as your integration constants, basically the starting value in each segment. Now I find when doing this, I find that writing what I call local equations works best and essentially local equations are going to use a, it's kind of like moving a y axis to the beginning of each loading segment. Okay, so whatever x, uh, x value you use in that calculus equation is just going back to the beginning of the loading segment and no further. And I find these um, local equations typically are quicker and easier than trying to write everything back to the origin. So basically what that's saying is instead of bringing everything back here to the left end at x equals zero, you're basically here for loading segment two, you'd bring over your x equals zero to the beginning of that segment. For, for the third loading segment, you'd bring it over to the left end as well.
Okay, so then you would just be measuring basically x. Instead of from the whole left end, you'd measure it from here for segment one, for here for segment two, and then for here for segment three. If you wanted to, I suppose you could write um, subscripts on these, and that would be fine. You could call this x1, you could call this x2, you could call this x3, because they are technically different x's if you're moving your axes over um, to deal with those. Um, but the equations themselves, um, like I said, they, they work really well, and they allow you to use whatever the end value of your previous loading segment as the beginning value for your next. And also, of course, still taking into account those concentrated forces or concentrated couples. All right, so that is the content that will be on your exam two. I appreciate your effort for studying for the exam. I believe in you and please reach out to our team if we can provide any help as you study.